so at Sherm, right, at, at Sherm Conference, uh, as I get which Sherm Conference, uh, we're, the, the topics are, are crazy. But this one is by far the one that's on most of our minds, right? Is the labor. And when I talk to the people, right, when we talk to people, when I say people, I'm talking executives, I'm talking managers, I'm talking the people themselves, this is by far the craziest and the, the biggest thing on everyone's minds. Why? Because there aren't people. We don't have people. And still, how much denial do we fix? How much do we, I mean, is this, anyone have this, right? Any of you in this chair? Right? Any of you in this chair? Right? Now, at the same time, how many of you were here a little over a year ago when we got done downsizing, right sizing, right? We can't fire them because that PPP loan, don't want to screw that up, so we can't. But we let them go on the first time instead of the third time, right? Yeah, because that, that was still okay. Um, but, uh, but, but we got done, and it was about, what, March, April, and what do we say? We said, all right, now that we're through that, I strongly recommend we go hire them now. <laughs> if you have that conversation, if you hear the audible laughter in the room? Uh-huh. Yeah, after that laughter, what I say, what did we say when we said, all right, and I also recommend, I need, I, hey, I see your sales demand because, hey, your sales demands are spiking. Why? Because they have a year and a half full of cash in their pockets and they all want what we've got. Those of us in retail, production, whatever else, they all want it now and they've got cash and they want it to go, go, go. But we're like, all right, you know, so our sales are going and this is great. It's gangbusters. This is, this is Disneyland. And so these are going up, and so everybody in sales, everybody, you know, the, the C-suite is, is going crazy. CFO is going like, this is super awesome. And we in HR are going like, yeah, we're at like 80% staff to what we were before because we all right-sized. And we're saying, look, here's what the projection says. Projection says, not only should we start to hire right now because we all see what's coming up, because we all know the shortage. Not only is the shortage, it's not the pandemic's fault, is it? This has been coming for a long time. We're gonna talk about this. This has been coming for a long time, and we've been telling you it's been coming for a long time. It's not the pandemic's fault. The pandemic just accelerated some of this. We've been telling you it's coming. And they're all thinking, well, hey, we just laid people off. So that just like every other cycle, just like every other cycle, you just go pick up who you want when we want. So we told them we need to go pick up talent right now. So we just got rid of them. Why do we want to pick them up? And by the way, I need six months lead time. Six months? What are you talking about? Because in the past, what? I throw out an application and in three days, I'll have a hundred resumes, right? And I tell them, no, I need six months. What are you talking about? It's gonna take me three months if I'm lucky to get them in. And it's gonna take me another three months to train them up to the level of proficiency that you need them at. Why? Because these folks are not gonna be at the same caliber that you are used to hiring them at. Huh? Yeah, that, that C-suite, huh? Y'all have that one? And uh, laughter is audible. Year later, year later. Why can't we hire anyone? Because a year ago, you didn't let me hire anyone. Y'all, anyone in that, in that spot? And you're biting your tongue saying, I told you so. <laughs> and you're not going to say it. It's because we're HR. And we're nice. <laughs> Where did this come from? Where did this come from? I don't know. I don't know. Supply and demand. Supply and demand. Now, this is just the last couple of years, right? We had the spike all of a sudden. Hey, you know, everybody shut down for the pandemic, and it caught back up really fast. But this, I mean, this has been around for some time. Right back in the, 19, in the early 90s, right, when some, some of us, a couple of us got in the game. Um, you know, uh, it was surprised me. Department of Labor just came out with a report in 1990, 30-year projection. 30-year projection of labor. And, and like 30 year okay, whatever. And it, it marked it right, supply and demand of labor. 2020, they marked it, and all of a sudden, 2020, boom, plummet. They called it 30 years before. 30 years now, they didn't see a pandemic coming, they didn't see all this other stuff coming, but 2020, they said plummet of the supply. Hmm. Hmm. We've known this thing was coming. The last six years we've been screaming from the from the rooftops that this has come and still here we are they said well what happened i don't know now the previous solutions is we'll just throw a bunch of cash out how's that working for us that may have worked initially right last year we could we, we got cash flying everywhere but everybody's been dancing everybody's been been moving around and doing the shuffle but now they've shuffled and there's still nothing out there and that's the case and here we are 
So, you know, the question is, you know, now what? They went playing whack-a-mole? We've been playing employee whack-a-mole for a year. You know, the one where they, your best employee says, hey, I got a job offer. Match it or I leave. And you have to make the decision. You want to keep them? Maybe, maybe not. And you say, oh, we don't need them. And then they leave. And then you realize we should have kept that one. <laughs> yeah? I'm not paying two bucks an hour more for that person. <laughs> two bucks an hour, 4,000 bucks. Oh, they're the only one that can operate that machine. Three million dollars worth of product can't get through because you aren't willing to pay four thousand bucks a year. That was genius. That was genius. Hmm. You're not the only one. So trends, you know, trends. Where this kind of, you know, how do we get here? I'm mean, just just spend a little bit of how we get here because we're all living it, and so I'm not going to dwell on this too much. Okay, I am. Just we'll, we'll have some group therapy together. For this. <laughs> um, you know, so how do we get here? Where are we at? What's it looking like? <laughs> it's not going to be fun, but I'll get you over the hump. And then, you know, what do we do about this? <clears throat> yeah, we'll, we'll work on this one together, trust me. Uh, but uh, here's, let's start here. So where do we, where did this come from? Let's start with item number one. We stopped having babies in the 90s. We stopped having babies in the 90s, folks. That's it, right? That's it. So uh, bump, 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 whoops, that's it. <laughs> and the current, the current group of, uh, of young adults are not gonna have any more kids than the last one. That's it. We have a population replacement challenge. Bottom line, we have a group of people that are retiring and the next group is not enough to fill it. Period, end of story. That's part one. So this baby bust, right? We stopped having babies in the 90s, fast forward one generation and guess what? Here we are. Now that's the basic math. That's the simple math. Let's complicate this. Item number two, we have the pandemic push out, right? We all told them they're ready to get out. <laughs> what do you think was happening? We're all going to come back? No, of course not. Daycare challenge. 1.5 million moms left because they can't afford it, can't find daycare. At least half of them aren't coming back, right? We all, y'all know that. We all feel that, right? How many daycares closed? And then they can't get started back up, mostly because of regulation, cost. Can't find people to come take care of it. Right, and, and who wants to come work at daycare when you can go work at McDonald's? They're advertising what, 16 bucks an hour? Daycare wasn't paying that much. Hmm. Immigration, we shut off the border six years ago. Well, we shut it off, we were trickling down before that, but uh, we have a whole lot of jobs that well, we're protecting American jobs. <laughs> we weren't taking those jobs, right? So we, we have all these other jobs that were not, they're not being filled, so we have that challenge. That's not gonna be uh, figured out anytime soon. Retirement, yeah, we had the silver tsunami that was going on, that hasn't stopped, but we also had an acceleration because what we didn't see was one million extra people retiring during the pandemic. And that accelerated trajectory hasn't slowed down. So we're not just on the silver tsunami, but we're at the accelerated rate. Why? Because they can't. They're saying, this is crazy, I'm out of here. So we have that going on. The work ethic, this is not just another round of those darn kids. You all see it, you all know it. I mean, they're good just, what, they're ghosting us, they go on break and they just don't come back. <laughs> right? And you know what, they can, because they're gonna walk down the street, if they decide to, they're not gonna, they're not gonna walk. They don't know how to walk. Uh, they're not gonna walk. Um, they're gonna Uber <laughs> down, or they're just gonna sit on the couch for a month until they decide they're out of they're out of beer money, and they're gonna go work until they get some more beer money, and then they'll ghost them and go on to the next one. Why? Because they can. Then gig workers, 2.5 million left to go do gig work, and at least half of them are not coming back. Why? Because they make more at the kitchen table or out of the garage, right? I mean, before the pandemic, at least 40% of all workers had a side gig. At least 40% before the pandemic were gigging, right? Uber, Lyft, Fiverr, something like that. 2.5 million left, and at least half of them are not coming back to the workforce. And then the great resignation, we say, oh, good thing that's behind us. No, it's not. We still have at least 4 million people a month resigning. And if we don't figure some things out now with the, with the way things are going, the talk on the street is that the Great Resignation was just a warm-up, starting this fall. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna get dicey. So, it's like, well, thanks, Wade. That's great. That's <laughs> Woo! all right. <laughs> Pass out the Xanax. All right. Awesome. <laughs> oh, I'm not done yet. Uh, hey, Jim. 
Yeah, uh, because uh, once they jump, once they're jumping ship, right, and they go over, and we'll talk about this a little bit in some of the in the, some of the wise. Once they jump ship to the next place, right, because the grass is always greener. Uh, that's just spray paint on the grass. Yeah, uh, they go over there. And we'll talk about this a little bit, but they go over there once they figure out that's just some spray paint. They're gonna go to the next one, and so and the next one, the next one, because they can, and usually they make more money on the jump. They make more money on the jump. So uh, now most most people who are running the projections are only running them out about eight to ten years because uh, they're still sitting around and going, like, I'm not going to project this thing out further. You do it. No, I'm not doing it. Um, but Bain and Associates went ahead and, and made the made the jump, and they projected out twenty to thirty years in advance. And uh, so they said, Hey, you know, just on average, right? If we do a steady economic growth, three to four percent, right? Highs, lows, whatever, normal stuff. Three to four percent economic growth. That's a good steady economic growth and uh, just general expansion that's where it's going to be at population may all things being equal if we get immigration back in a little bit because it's not going to come internally maybe we'll have maybe 11 million more in the workforce population maybe okay over 30 years that's not a lot of people right not for not for 350 million almost 400 million people in the united states that's not a big push. so essentially we have a flat population uh, in the workforce okay Here's the challenge that we also have that's going to complicate this. The big challenge is talent capability. <laughs> talent capability. Um, we can't learn, right? Our ability to learn is going down. The ability, and you've seen this, the ability to learn, critically think, problem solve, that learning capability is going down. Yeah, the smart people are getting smarter, but on a whole, most people aren't able to learn, aren't able to perform, they're not able to do. We've been handing it to them so easy that they haven't learned how to learn. You want an answer? Go to Google. You want to do math? Do the calculator, right? You can't do math in your head. You can't, do, you can't do this in your head. You can't learn how to learn. And so the ability to learn has gone down. And it's, the trajectory is getting worse. It's actually on a downward slope of the trajectory. And so even if we had enough people to meet the demand, we don't have the skill set or the talent or the capability to get there on the current trajectory. Hmm. All things being equal. All things being equal, which is the key to all this. That's the key to all of this. <laughs> Very double dose that. All right, back to the original question. This sets us up for the rest of the, of the conversation. How are you going to solve the problem today? Hmm. This gets us to the Covey principle of the day. The Covey principle of the day is you can't cram the harvest. You can't get to September and say, oh my gosh, I forgot to plant the field. <laughs> right? You can't just say, let's hurry and go plant the field really fast and let's spring this up so we can harvest at the 1st of October. It doesn't work that way. Now, some organizations saw this coming, right? We saw, we saw this coming, they've been practicing, they've been doing some things, and they've been working it well. I call this the 10, 20, 50, 20 rule. You're doing, oh, it's another weightonomics again. It's like, <laughs> yep, it's 100. Okay, uh, so about 10% of organizations have caught on and figured this thing out, and they've been actively working on this. That's the 10% have been trying some new things out, moving ahead, doing some stuff. You want to pay attention to those 10%, because they're going to be around. They're going to stick around. There's another 20% that have caught on that things aren't right. It's not the same. Um, they'll figure it out. They'll come across here soon, but it's going to get painful. The longer they wait, the more painful it's going to be, and they'll catch on, and they'll start to make some adjustments. There's about 50% that are catching on that this ain't right, but there are also the 50% that are trying to apply the same standards of all the other cycles, right? Because we've always gone in cycles. The last 125 years, we've gone through these Keynesian economic cycles. Everything has relationships. When you have unemployment, other things happen with, uh, with enrollment in schools, with recessions, with housing, with employment, with, with all these other things. These cycles have been pure. And so a lot of businesses have said, oh, we're just going to wait this thing out. I don't have to worry about employment because I'll just wait this thing out. If I wait for another 18 months, I'll just wait it out and I'll have enough help. If I just wait this thing out a little bit longer, it'll all come back and I'm not going to react. I'm not going to have this knee-jerk reaction. I don't have to because I'll just wait this thing out. Why? Because the four other times in my career that this has happened, it's always done this. And those cycles have been pure. There's been a little variation as to how long in between the cycles that it's happened, but the actual relationships between the variables, unemployment, um, the, the economy, the recession, you know, the, whatever, the interest rates, all these things, the relationships in the past have all been pure. 
They've all been pure, and they've all been predictable. Every single cycle. So all they're thinking in their head is, hey, this is like the fourth or the fifth time I've seen this in my career. All I have to do is wait this out because this is what's going to happen. Lather, rinse, repeat. This time around, every rule has been broken. Every relationship has been broken. Unemployment goes up and these other things are going up instead of down. This goes up, these things are going down instead of up. All the relationships are breaking. And so despite what we're telling them and saying, hey, this is different, they're still in disbelief. This 50% is still saying, no, but we'll just wait it out. This 50% is going to hurt, and it's going to hurt bad. And it's up to them as to whether or not they're going to listen and pay attention. The other 20%, they'll never listen, and if they're in business in the next 12 months, I'll be shocked. So all these businesses that are going out of business, yeah, it's still them. And that 20% is actually fairly conservative. I think it's going to be higher than that. We have businesses that are buying other businesses just to get their labels. So, anyway, but that's it. So, here's the roadmap. Here we go. You're looking at 10 going like, are we going to get there yet? Here we go. That's the status. That's the status of what we have. And so, in talking um, talking to folks you know, in different you know, across the country, in different realms, different industries, this is the same thing going on no matter your industry, no matter the geographic location, no matter where we're at. These are the same things happening, the same pain points, the same whatever else. And yes, the recession is coming. Does that mean unemployment? Yeah, it does. But the wrong, it's not gonna be your highly skilled people. Your highly skilled people are still gonna be employed. They will always have a job. It's gonna be the low skilled workers that will be available. That's not who you're gonna be hurting for. All right, so here's what we've got, right? In terms of planting the field, well, it's too, you know, you can't just cram the field. So what can you do? So the solution is here, right? You can't go to the doctor and say, oh my gosh, I have chest pains. I gotta lose hundred pounds by tomorrow, doctor. I'm gonna die. <laughs> Doctor's gonna, <laughs> yeah, that's not gonna happen. But there are things that you can start right now, immediately, in the short term, mid term, long term, to get us started right now. And that's where we're at, is we have to take simultaneous steps, short term, long term, long, short term, mid term, long term actions. And that's where we're at today. The sooner you start simultaneously in these three areas, the sooner you're gonna start to see results. The longer you push these out, the longer you're in denial, the more it's going to hurt. Bottom line. There is no quick fix. End of story. There's no quick fix you're going to do. So let's talk about these. You're going to be like, we don't have enough time to cover all these. That's right. I have some choices. I could either take one of one in each category and define them and, and work on them in depth, or I could give you a scatter of, of these things, and you can make up your own stuff. I decided to take the scattered approach. All right. Because you're all smart people, and you can apply them differently. So here's what you're gonna do, and uh, you know I'll post these, I'll make it available, Amy, so you can send this out to everybody on your slides. So uh, let's talk about some things in short-term, mid-term, long-term, and uh, I'll run through these. So yes, some of these will have a little bit more than others, uh, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull through them fairly fast. And you can use your imagination. Some things will apply more to others, um, and that's okay. You need, you need more on any of these? Give me a call later. All right, short-term, let's talk on these. First things first, right? We talk about retention, and it's like, oh my gosh, I didn't take notes. I know, I got it. Uh, it's gonna be like that, like for the next 40 minutes, it's gonna be great. All right. Uh, retention, we're gonna talk about keeping your employees, uh, like, well, I'm gonna talk on each of these, so don't worry, I'm gonna put the slides here just before you're done. Uh, retention, keeping your employees. Culture is about making them actually wanna stay there. And redef redefining work is about do doing work differently. And then here when recruitment, then we get finding what you need. Most people are gonna flip this around and start backwards. That's the wrong thing. Stop recruiting first. We're gonna do this in reverse order, okay? So with that in mind, let's figure out why we're gonna do this in reverse order. Should we stop recruiting? No, don't stop recruiting, but understand that recruiting is not your top priority. <coughs> that can't be your top priority. Priority. Let's figure out why. All right, first things first is retention. You gotta answer some questions before you go any further. First question to answer is, why should anyone come work for you? But also, why should anyone stay with you? If you haven't asked this of your C-suite, you should. And remind them that this is not a rhetorical question. Oh, I did this. It's uncomfortable, it's great. If you don't have an answer for this, your employees don't have an answer for this. If your employees don't know why they should stay with you, they won't. Hmm. Why should anyone stay with you? And then when you use it for recruitment, why should anyone come to work for you? Basic answer, basic question. But if you don't have the answer, the answer, you're not gonna. 
So when we talk about products and services, you talk about competitive advantages. So what's yours when it comes to you being an employer? We talk about unique selling propositions or unique value props. What's yours as an employer? What sets you apart? If you don't have an answer for these, your employees don't have one either. So yeah, this works for retention and recruitment both. But if you don't have answers to this, neither do your employees. Hmm. So here's the dealio, right? This has to be the number one strategy of your business. I don't care what your business is. I don't care what you make, what you sell, for profit, not for profit, government, I don't care what you are. I don't care what your business strategy is. Retention has to be the number one strategy, not the number one HR strategy. Retention has to be the number one business strategy of your organization. End of story. If it's not, you're screwed up. Is that too hard? Let me rephrase it a different way. If it's not the number one business strategy, you're screwed up. <laughs> Yeah, okay, that sounded better. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You got to know why they're leaving, why they're staying, and what they want, and give it to them. Does this mean that we're held hostage? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> is what it is. All right. Let's talk about the culture, why that comes in next. Culture means what? How we do things around here. If that's not set straight, it doesn't matter what you promise them for your current employees, it doesn't matter what you promise them to come work for you. When they come in through the front door, they're going to find out whether that grass is green or stuff is just spray paint. If it's just a facade, they're going to find out fast. Why? Because they're going to start talking to your your real, your real uh, your employees. Your current employees are going to find out, you know, they're going to realize, hey, you know, our, our management's not talking to us. They're not transparent. They don't. We don't know what the company's future is and they want to know. They want to know, am I going to have a job here in two years, three years? Is there a future here? They want to know that stuff. And if you don't share it, well, we've never had to share that before. Doesn't matter what you had to do before, the rules have changed. Well, I'm the CEO, I don't have to share that. Then don't. Just don't be shocked when they're not here tomorrow. They need to know this stuff, right? So, you know, when the employees come through the front door, you got to deliver on your promises. But to your current employees too, you got to deliver on the promises there. How many times do you promise these great big bonuses for people to come join your company, but then you don't take care of your current employees? Ten thousand dollars come walking through the door, and the current employees are going like, "What? Do I have to quit to get ten thousand dollars? Where am I at?" No, I'm sorry, I don't have ten thousand dollars for you. I've been here for twenty-five years. Yeah, no. <laughs> Bye. That's happening. That happens. You know. Also, we have to keep in mind the five-day rule. The five day rule. New employees coming in through the front door. When you buy a used car, I don't care how off, how much you have that car checked out. When you drive that thing off the lot, what are you doing? You're listening. Every single noise, bump, whatever, hiccup, because you want to confirm that you made the wrong choice. That you bought 11, right? Employees are doing the same thing. They're doing the exact same thing. When they come on to work for you, they're, they're checking you out to say, did I make the wrong choice to come work for you? For about five days, they're going to decide, do I want to stay? Do I keep my LinkedIn profile up as looking? <laughs> do I keep my resume on NDs? And uh, how many of you, I know I've had a few, give you, as soon as they leave, they give you the call back, have you filled my job yet? Have you had that? I've had, I've had actually a few. I've had a number of people give me a call back because it's been a great idea to leave. Hey, I'm going to go get some more money. They go and get a better job. Forget you, Wagstaff. I'm going somewhere else. <laughs> Adios, right? You got my job still. For you, no, I don't. <laughs> Is it filled? Nope. <laughs> but good luck, right? Others uh, be like, "Is my job filled?" Nope. We're gonna just call this a uh, week off. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't processed your termination yet. This is just called an unpaid week of uh, personal time. Thank you. We're just gonna forget that this happened. You report here on Monday. Yep. All right. How's that work out for you? You are now, you're my ambassador. Got it? Yep. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And then they become my loyal employee for the next little bit. Um, and that happens. That's okay. Because why culture does matter. Culture, culture uh, trumps pay. Culture trumps pay. The person left for 30% pay increase and a great job title. That's great. 
What they didn't tell her is that as a manager, she gets a cube and she has to write on the whiteboard every time she spends five minutes to go to the bathroom. She didn't like that. It's great. Um, but uh, hey, culture matters. Sometimes with culture, right, you start saying, all right, well, what's our culture? You have to define it, but you also have to take it from their perspective. You say, well, our culture is about pay and benefits. We offer these great things. Well, in your mind, it might be. Ask when the last time was that you had a reality check on what your pay and benefits is to define your culture. We have great pay, great benefits. Why is it great? Because I said they were. This is what's great for me. We offer a 401k and a, and a, we have a we have a, what profit sharing? Yeah, we have profit sharing. Where does your profit sharing go? In the 401k. All right. Well, that's great. Anyone under the age of 42 doesn't care about your 401k. Why? Because it's it's invisible money. So when they leave to go get a new job and they have the pay increase, guess what? They do not take that eight percent into consideration. They would just assume put it into crypto or something else that's tangible. They'll want to pay down their student debt. They want to do something else other than pretend that there's money in an investment account that, let's be honest, over the last six months, I don't know, it's been pretty flat at best. That's if you if you invested well, and for most people, phew, taking hard. So what do you do on your 401k, <laughs> right? Instead, what do they want? They want that. They want that. And you know what? The cost of this is probably less than the cost of this. They want continuous growth. They want to have a say in the company. They want this kind of stuff. They want purpose. They want significant tasks. They actually want you to hire them for what they can do and have you do that and let them do it. Hire good people and get out of their way. That's what they want. They want to make a difference. And we don't. Instead, we hire them and said, you know what? You're going to sit in the corner over there for a bit. And then they rocked. That's what we do. Do you think that's strictly a generational mindset or do you think that that this has transcended generations for what people are looking for. This is what we've always wanted, and we've just been quiet about it. I think the boomers have been told to show up to work and be quiet and shut up, mm -hmm. and that's what you've adapted to. I think we in Gen X, we were just breaking the rules, and we've just adapted, flowed a little bit as, as Xers. Uh, the millennials, they've always wanted this, and they've been flowing towards this, but the, uh, Gen, but the uh, Gen Z, they said, if you don't offer this to me, screw you. And we're just not going to put up with you. And so I think deep down inside, we all want this. I think this is human need. And uh, I think the uh, anybody under under about the age of 45 is just done with it and saying, this is what we want. This is what we demand and we can demand it. And uh, everybody else wants it. Everybody else wants it. So now they're just getting it. All right. Another thing that we need to start taking a look at is how we read is to redefine work. Right? We need to redefine work. And this is something where we have to be a lot more nimble about it. In the past, we say, all right, I have a team of four people. I have a vacancy, so what do we do? Get pull out the job description, throw it out there online, and say, this is what I need. And here we go, and we wait for, for six to eight weeks. Oh my gosh, I can't find anybody. Why? Because that does, job doesn't exist. Now is the perfect time to take a step back and say, you know what? Instead of saying I have a team of four jobs, instead what I have is I have four people performing 100 tasks. 100 tasks, 100 competencies, 100 whatever else. Now's a perfect time to take a step back and say, you know what? What can I eliminate? What are we doing that we shouldn't be doing? Right? Why are we doing it? Because we've always been doing it. What can you eliminate? What can you automate? And you automate the heck out of it. What can we delegate? What can you outsource? And what can you push down the lowest level so you don't have level three people doing level one work? And then when you get all done, then what can you consolidate? So that in the end, you know what? Maybe you have the highest, the highest paid people doing the highest paid work and the lowest paid people doing the lowest paid work. In the end, you may not even need that, that fourth job. You may not even need that job in the, in the end. Did I just eliminate a job? No, you just don't have to replace one because you can't find it anyway. But if you do need that job, then you have somebody because now you have a lower skill set, you have a better chance of finding someone who can fill that job and you have a better shot. Now's the time to redefine work. <laughs> this last week, we've had two cobots coming into our place, collaborative robots, helping us well. In the past, you say, well, you're going to automate to get rid of jobs. No, now we're talking about how do we bring in automation so that we can keep the doors open. And so these cobots are so simple, I don't, you don't even have to know how to program. They're going to help us well. And so to experiment with this, we took uh, recently, uh, a guy just graduated from high school this year. And so he doesn't know anything, right? He has a little bit of welding experience, but he's our welder tech. 
not a welder, not a welder. She is not a welder. And we said, you know what? We're not going to do this. We're not going to over. We're not going to overdo this. We're not going to over-engineer this. Like, here, here's the instruction manual. You just you go do this, and I want you to prep the demo. And he had one day, one day. And so I tapped into him with my with my uh, academy that we're doing. I said, can you give us a 15 minute demo? In 15 minutes, he was able to show us how he programs this this welder, this welding robot, to do four welds. Straight weld, a complicated weld. He welded this cylinder to a base, right? And another one, complicated welds. In 15 minutes, he's able to do all four of these things. And you look at these things, they're precision welds. You don't have to grind them, you don't have to clean them. These are the best welds you've ever seen. This kid, 18 years old, no experience, is able to facilitate it like that. It's better than my welder threes can do. Did I mean, get replaced the welder threes? No, absolutely not. Right? The welder threes do other things. But on these on these kinds of jobs, that welder tech I can hire for what, 20 bucks an hour? 19, 20 bucks an hour? And I can do 35 hour thirty-five dollar an hour work with the help of this cobot. That cobot, is it expensive? Eighty grand doesn't come on sick. <laughs> or ghostly. <laughs> But also by, by breaking this down, then it's going to help me with recruitment because now I know exactly what I need and I can help read it and I can help define that and, and help find these people. Okay, at each step of the way, then I can help them know what I need, how do I want when they come in, then I know what I'm training to. Okay, these are some pieces and parts that I can do with retention. I can retain, I can create the, manage the culture, I can redefine work, and then I can recruit more effectively. These are some steps that you can take in the short term to, to, help, to help you out right away. I know, I took a little extra time on that piece, but it, it'll get faster, but anyway, just some, some examples. All right, midterm, midterm things. All right, first things first, we're gonna talk about leadership, work format, automation, upskilling, and upgrading. I'm not gonna take nearly as much time on each, so here we go, let's pick up the pace a little bit. All right, first things first, your manager. Culture and managers are the two reasons why people leave. They'll tell you pay because it's an easy conversation. Leave it for pay. All right, see you, kid. Um, but uh, manager and pay are the, are the two busy, biggest reasons. Number one reason, your manager is the company. To the employee, the manager is the company. It doesn't matter what your CEO says, doesn't matter what your new initiative is, doesn't matter what the, what the memo says or what the email says. To the employee, the manager is the company. The CEO comes out with a new speech, a new video, new whatever else, here's the new whatever else, it's gonna be, whoa, we got t-shirts, we got cake, great stuff. <laughs> it changed everything. And then the employee looks at the manager to see what the reaction is. And if the manager is like, yeah, all right, whatever. The employees are going to be like, yeah, all right, whatever. And now it's not a priority. It's done, it's killed, it's over. If the manager says, yep, that's it, this is how we're going to do things, and that manager then holds the employees accountable to it, then that's the way it is. To the employee, the manager is the company. Their attitude, their accountability, everything to the man to the employee, the manager is the company. End of story. The manager will make or break everything to the employee. It affects their attitude, it affects their morale, it affects their, their, their performance, it affects everything. Challenge is, is that because we had so much turnover, we have a lot of people that got into management spots that don't, I mean we had this that, that don't belong there. We had that before the pandemic. We really have it down. And so we have people that definitely don't belong in management at all. But now that we have them there, they're not prepared. And so uh, we need to get them trained. We need the basic toolkits, but they have no power skills. We call them soft skills, but this sounds better, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have no soft skills. We're in manufacturing. That sounds too soft. Power skills, all right. <clears throat> yeah, manufacturing, love it. All right, so uh, power skills. So if they don't have the people skills, they're gonna be awful, right? the employees disconnect and game over. So if they can't, if the managers can't connect the dots and help the employees understand how what they do connects to the bigger picture, the employees disconnect, they don't understand how what they do affects everybody else and that's gonna be, uh, that's gonna impact everything else. If the, instead the, the manager can help the employees say, understand, look, what you do affects the person down the road and, and up the road. If you don't work fast enough, it clogs everything up and we have a bottleneck. If what you do becomes sloppy and we have to re, you know, we have to come back and redo it, not only do we have a cost involved, but you're also going to slow it up because now we have to pause, redo it, and that gums everything up again. It's bottleneck. Manager can help with that. 
Manager's gonna coach them, gonna help them, gonna improve their performance. Manager has to connect the dots. Manager needs to have business know-how. Manager needs to understand how everything works together. And a lot of times we may help them with some basic essentials of, of management, but we don't train them on things like operations management. How does your business work? Does your manager know how your business works? Does your manager have the ability to call the other department and say, hey, Joe, we gotta talk because what your engineers are sending us right now, it doesn't make sense. Can they get together and go fix some stuff? That's what we're talking about. So your leadership needs to work in order for the whole thing to flow. That's, I call this midterm because you're not gonna change this overnight, but you have to address the leadership. End of story. Now, maybe you're gonna talk about, you know, maybe it, it's not a one size fits all. You get some group sessions, whether it's small sessions, in class sessions, on site, out of site, whatever it is. Incorporate self study, have some, some guidance there, send them to school, do whatever you need to take. It's gonna be a multifaceted approach. Get mentoring involved. People who do it best, get them set up. Every men, every good manager that you have should be mentoring at least one or two other other leaders and managers. And then the accountability is key. If you don't hold them accountable, it will never work. These are some pieces and parts moving along, going along just because it's that kind of thing. I'll, I'll send it to you. All right, uh, strategies. <laughs> work format. We've had a lot of talk about, hey, the pandemic's over, get your butt back to work. Yeah, survey says if it's working out the way that it is, don't wreck a good thing. Before you bring them back to work, to the workplace, ask yourself why. Now, if it's a customer interface thing and the customers come to your workplace, okay, I get that. But even then, if what they're doing is working well and they perform well at home in their environment, ask yourself whether you want to mess with a good thing. If it's because, well, I need them to engage with the team, I need that flow, I need something from happening. Okay, talk about hybrid. What does hybrid look like? Does something else work? But just because, you know, butts and seats is not a metric. But just keep that in mind. That flexibility is something that we've asked them for the last two years to adjust to our needs, to get out of the workplace, but still perform. I need you out of here, but still meet your metrics. We've asked them to conform for the last two years, change their lives, change the lives of their kids, their families, their dogs. And now we're saying, okay, time's over, flip it back. Before you do, ask why. Okay? Chances are, don't break a good thing because they'll just quit on you and go somewhere that'll let them have the flexibility. Next thing is automation. We'll take this from two perspectives. One is HR and one is the business. Okay, Automate, 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 and then you're gonna be about ready to automate. Okay? The, the better you can free yourself up, the more you can go do the real stuff of your business. HR, I've talked about this multiple times but free yourself from the stuff so you can go do real HR work with your people. I, I cannot stress this enough. When you can get rid of the admin part of HR, then you can go deal with the people and the practices and the leadership part of HR. Uh, and trust me, for 25 years I was looking for HR Zen, for, for admin Zen, finally. Um, but when you can free this up and you can get it under here, when my managers can do all of their stuff on their phone, when payroll can run payroll on their tablet. I mean, seriously, I don't deal with this. And when we find something that we haven't automated yet, we automate it. We do, because I don't want to spend any more time than I have to dealing anything with admin. We automate the crud out of it. That's a technical term. <laughs> and then we find another way to streamline it. Do it, it's worth every penny. And if your current system is awful, take it out back and shoot it as fast as you can and get a system that works. I shot my, I shot mine. I mean, found one, it's like, eh, they, they had a lot of promise. They didn't work. And uh, I was still paying on that horse and I just took it out back and shot it because that horse didn't plow. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Does that come out loud? Oh, I'm turning again. But even in the business, I talked about, I talked about the, the cobots, but, but do it. Uh, upskilling. With the new technology, you're going to have to make your employees keep up with it. You have to have them keep up. It helps them to grow and develop. That's a, that's a need that they have. It helps them feel relevant. It meets their need. But you also need to make sure that they keep up with the times. Keep them upskilled. But then comes what I call upgrading. You're not going to be able to find on a consistent basis those people who you're used to finding out there in the marketplace. Find them low, bring them in, grow them from within. Colmac Coil up in Colville figured this out a long time ago. 
No one's gonna, they're not gonna find uh, high-end welders who are gonna go move to Colville. Okay. So they find people with a good base qualities, they hire them and they go run them through their six-week program. And they become skilled coil welders. They have a high retention rate. It's been working for years. That's the way we're gonna have to start doing. That's where we're moving towards in manufacturing, and that's what we're looking at. Those are your midterm solutions. It has to happen right now. You have to start working on these things. It's gonna take more than overnight, so that's why I said midterm. All right, I know, it's like more solutions. Yeah, I know, we're blown through, but this is the kind of stuff we're talking about. I promise these ones won't take as long, but I need to introduce these longer term solutions because these are gonna take a bit longer, but these are more necessary because these are the ones you have to start working on. Now, this is planting your crops. Number one, internally, you gotta start working on some things. All right, I'm gonna just point out one or two things here. Your succession planning. If you did succession planning about three years or longer ago, throw it out, because it's useless. Given your turnover, if you had any turnover at all within the last three years like normal, it's probably useless unless you kept up on it. If you kept up on it, great, that's fantastic. Most of us didn't have enough time to keep up on it because of how much turnover we had. If that's the case, it's probably time to just kind of set it aside and restart. Go reshuffle, redo, it's time to redo your, your succession plan. But the key that I want to point out here are IDPs, individual development plans. You need to set that up. Every single person needs to know what their, what is their trajectory, what's your goal for them, what's their part that they play in the organization and they need to feel connected. They need to know what plan you have for them. Now, if they don't ask it in the interview, I'd actually be shocked. More people will ask you in the interview before they ask about pay, they're gonna ask you, what's up next after this job where do you see me and you better have an answer so once they come on board part of your answer is let's set you up with an individual development plan what's your next plan what's your next development step let's set you up because if once you come they come in you really don't have a plan for what's next they're going to get at you you better have a plan for what they're grow how they're growing how they're developing and what your game plan is idps are going to be essential that's internal. Let's talk about external. Externally, you need to start engaging. You need to engage with where your sources are for your people. If you don't know where your people are coming from, that's step one, figure out where your people come from, your primary people. Most of us have sources. Most of us have some key sources for our key positions. Maybe not every single position. In our case, we have welders and machinists and engineers. Those are our key people, right? We know where they come from. We know where they come from. We also know that those places that they're coming from are empty the classrooms are hollow they're empty the machinists the welders colleges are empty they used to be brimming and full we made that assumption they're empty i can't recruit from the colleges because now i have to go to high school so if i go to the high schools in k-12 guess what if you haven't built relationships with k-12 you can't just say hey bring me your your students so what you're gonna find at K-12 is, when you go to the juniors and seniors, they've become disconnected, especially with the pandemic. What you also find when it's in my world is we've been telling kids for the last 20 some years that the trades are, for, are dirty, they're for dumb kids. They're for people who can't hack the four-year college. And so for you special kids, we have the trades. <laughs> what we don't tell them is that it's a highly technical uh, field and that you can go to a little bit of school, come out debt free, and start to make about $50,000 a year at age 20. Not bad. By the time you're age 25, when everybody else is graduating with their four-year degree, you'll probably be making about 80K a year. I'm gonna tell them that little secret. Yeah, yeah, but we don't. And so what happens is by the time they get into high school, it's too late because they've already had their mindset on four-year college, I wanna go do something else. And so we miss some opportunity. Now we have to engage uh, seriously, fifth grade is our sweet spot. I'm recruiting out of kindergarten, to be honest. <laughs> here, kid, have a sucker. Come here, this is called a welder. Look. Mom, it won't shock, I promise. But um, <laughs> you think I'm joking. Uh, but it's time to start building these relationships with, uh, call it with, uh, with K-12. It means showing up to job fairs. It means asking teachers, what can I do to help? It's building the, those relationships and then going to the colleges, universities, trades as being active in those arenas to say, how can I get in front of the kids? Not to just market, but to actually be part of the solution. 
part of the solution. And that um, you know, opening it up to say, to understand it's more than just degrees, it's apprenticeships, industry industry recognized certifications. Right? It's more, it's it's knowledge. It's knowledge and skills, it's not just degrees that you have to start looking at. And so, you know, looking at other solutions too. We have to look beyond just the traditional options here. You have vets coming out of the military that are highly qualified. You've got you've got uh, people changing careers that, that are great opportunities. People returning to the workforce that have years off. We have to stop questioning those gaps of employment. We have to stop questioning that. Prior offenders, if it doesn't relate to the job, you've got to ask the questions and say, where are they now? I've had a lot of people that found Jesus. It, uh, after they after they look on their careers and like well, I did this like tell me a good story tell me a good story because right here I have this well I found this I found God I found this I found this you know what I'm gonna give you a shot and they turn out to be some of my best people because I tell them like here's my set of expectations here's my set of, of terms and conditions this is that they said I will not let you down and they don't and they don't yes we're hiring some people that before I probably would have said yeah no that's not gonna happen even yesterday, we have this one. It's like, are you going to do it? It's like, huh, I probably wouldn't even hire him today, but well, we really knew him because his scores are off the chart for welding. If the silverware goes missing, you don't. <laughs> I know he can't pack the CNC machine in his truck, but uh, there's a lot of stuff. So don't, don't, don't come screaming to me if the silverware is gone. But uh, um, your call, manager. I mean, your call. But uh, they're like, no, you know, we're going to take a risk on him. Okay. Okay, but that, I mean, those are conversations we're having, but we're taking some risks because we are, we are. But this is new territory for us and it's actually been working out for us. New new world, new world, and it's turned out all right. Um, but uh, also, you know, like I said, take a look at your job descriptions. If right now you're still worried about four year degrees and, uh, and X number of years of experience, start to question why, start to question why. And do you really need that degree? Do you really need that degree? Or do you need the knowledge base? And if you need the knowledge base, how else can they get it? Do you really need that two year degree? And we've been asking that. Do you really need that two year degree from NIC or SCC in machining? Or do you need a knowledge base? And I'm like, you don't need that degree. You need something else. Start asking that question. And if it's there just because it's been there for the last 10 years or 20 years, it's time to, time to make some shifts. That's going to be huge. It's going to be huge. So this is one of the projects we have, right? This is one of the projects we have. So a few years ago, we came up with, uh, we, we started this. Now, Vista has their uh, their uh, energy pathways program where they brought in about 20 kids. I think they had 16 the first year. And they run it through a four week program uh, to give them some experience in all their major job areas within the Vista. Well, they're big, they're a Vista, they can do that. They want to give them some hands-on experience in all the major job areas uh, within the Vista. Well, they can do that because they can hire whoever they want. That's a Vista. So I was invited one time to, to go in and see this, and, and uh, so someone was who invited me said, so what do you think? You do this at Wagstaff? I'm like, all right, game on, let's do this. Uh, so uh, you know, we take a look at this, how can I build this at Wagstaff? And I realized this is too big for Wagstaff. We can't hire that many people, and we make really big stuff. There's no way I can bring these kids in to do this. And so what I did was, you know, we take a look at this, because in manufacturing, our current unemployment rate is 2.6. Full employment's like three, three and a half percent, which means what? We're employing people that shouldn't be employed. <laughs> but seriously, um, <clears throat> yeah, some days. But so, I mean, the first year I reached out to some other manufacturers, right? Uh, Pearson and uh, or not, yeah, Pearson and, and uh, McKay and Kaiser and, and uh, Alltech, a few others, and said, "Hey, what do you think?" So I took a competition approach. Said, "Hey, we all hire each other's people, right? We have a problem here. What do you think?" And so we put together the production manufacturing. And so uh, we, we start off with four weeks. Last last time we dropped it to three weeks to see, and so we were able to streamline a little bit. Uh, but we bring in, you know, about 20 kids. 20 kids over these over these weeks, they represent kids from all over the place. And we just said, we're gonna run them through the entire manufacturing production process. So when they come in, right, they're assigned teams, and these teams act as production units. So we assign them, uh, they have to take a project, right? They're gonna take one of these products, they're gonna design it, make it whatever the quote is sell it they have to do the whole the whole thing so during these weeks together what do we do right we give them quotas like you gotta make these 25 units 25 units whatever the product is we give them initial quotas and they're like, ah, yeah not a problem <laughs> but a lot of these kids actually don't have any experience in the shop which is kind of funny <clears throat> and then it's not 
Um, are we teaching business plans? Hey, you got to think, I know you want to put racing stripes on that birdhouse, but here's a customer, right? You actually have to sell this thing. We let them price it. We give them guidance, but let them price it. They sell, but again, they have to sell all these things. We don't do it. We set up the point of sale website, but then they have to drive the sales on all these things. We uh, teach them design, principles of design. So they have to create these prints, right, to, to work off of. Uh, we put them in the shop, teach them a little bit of safety, and then we kind of let them have that. We put them through a prototype day, let them chunk some stuff out, learn some things, bust up some boards. Yeah, last year it was a little expensive on wood. <laughs> yeah. But most of them have most of their fingers after the first day. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but then we go into full production. Have that. And uh, so we take over East Valley, East Valley High School, and, uh, and, and we have that. And boom, there they go, each team. So, uh, you know, some of them have different projects, different products, but I act as kind of the, the boss, and they're all production units, and they are active. They have to produce these things. But in between, we send them off to different places. So Hawk Ridge, for example, they let us go over and learn about 3D printing and solid works. We do some engineering, take them off to learn about some of these exposure things here. We have a welding day. So like tomorrow, people come over from Kaiser, uh, Kaiser Aluminum and Wagstaff. We'll take them through some different rounds, teach them some different types of welding. First time people get sticks in their hands. So uh, we just hired a guy yesterday for the first time he'd ever experienced welding was this day. He liked it so much he went and got a certification. So we just hired him last month, full time. Um, we take some tours of some different places, see what manufacturing looks like. So last week they went, uh, this, this current group went to Pearson, played with robots. Uh, but they they make these different products, right? And uh, and they're selling them. So I mean, this is in, this is from years past. But they make these products, and they go through the rubber. I mean, they, they get feedback, and it's not the kind of feedback they're used to in school. Like, I'm not gonna pay five bucks for this. Take that back and fix this thing. So they get some direct stuff. But we then we send it out. We put them in front of people to sell this stuff. We throw up some surprises, such as, hey, tomorrow you're gonna have a street sale. Figure out how to get people there. <laughs> And uh, we, I mean, that day they made 1500 bucks. They, they had figured, it's the worst corner ever. Um, and they figured out how to get people there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, they just, boom, here we go. Um, but yeah, I mean, they figured out how to make, sell, and produce these things. Now in between, just like manufacturing, they had memos come up. Things happen, supplier challenges, change orders. <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> but in the end, by the time we got done, this was the first year, right? The first year we did this. This is, uh, I mean, in the end, they made 64 cutting boards, 55 birdhouses, 40 these little speaker box things, cornhole sets, full size, these big things. They made 5,200 bucks. Dang. So they, it's like one day a week that they leave school to come to this? How, how is it set up? Summertime. So during the summer, they're with us from 8.30 to 3.30, five days a week. And uh, the first year was for four weeks. Now it's for three weeks. They make fifteen hundred bucks as a stipend for the three weeks. The first year for two thousand bucks, and so about five hundred bucks a week. And they get one CTE credit from high school. Of like this. How do they? How? Asking for a friend. So, so this year. Um, so now, now what's happening? You know, when we get to the graduation. I'm, I'll come back to that one here in a second. Uh, this year, uh, because of the funding that we have from the employers, right? The employers out there, we collect the money, and that's what gets us the stipends. That what gets the, that's what gets us the um, uh, the product, right? To for the wood and, and everything else like that. The money itself, because I don't want to have to do the accounting on that, right? And so we just let the school have it. It's like you do it. It's charitable donation. I, it's gonna cost me fifty two hundred bucks to do the bookkeeping, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so we just let the school keep it. That way it covers all the busing, all the people, the help, do some stuff, replace shop that we broke, <laughs> um, all that kind of stuff. But then we do graduation. But then we had enough, we usually have had enough in the end uh, to fund a couple of scholarships. And then Spokane Valley Chamber, uh, they have a foundation. They give away scholarships to SCC or actually NIC um, for any Valley kid who wants to go to, uh, to production. And uh, they offer scholarships as well. So it, this year, um, this year we decided to do uh, satellites. I was always challenged, can you get more kids in? It's like, can you do two of them? <laughs> no. <laughs> you do more kids? No. Um, but we decided to do satellites. So we tried to do, tried to do it with K-Tech. No one signed up for that one. Tried to do it with Cheney. Didn't have enough kids, so a couple of their kids came with us. But this year we're doing it with Newport. Newport High School. Can we do it with Rural? So they tap in by Zoom. They have a production unit there. They have three teams. They're doing three, three units up there. And uh, my team, uh, we've got 22 kids right now. 
five five teams making five products. So that's what's going on right now. But through this, I mean, the whole goal of this was uh, the whole goal of this is is not it's not about the kids right now. It's not about the thirty three kids. Right? It's not about the thirty three kids. It's about the momentum. What we've been able to gain, we had to take a year off with the with the uh, um, you know with the pandemic. But it's not about the the kids. It is about the kids. It's not about the kids. We've been able to create more conversation, more open doors with more people about CTE because of this than anything else. I've got more access to more schools, more access to anybody anywhere about CTE because of this program than ever before. So our donations, whatever else, we, we created a momentum four years ago that hasn't stopped, it's only grown. And so we've had a lot of convergence, a lot of energy, a lot of things that have happened because we've created this momentum. So again, it's not just the program. It's not, the, I mean, it is the program, but it's not the program. There's a lot more momentum that came out of this. And that's the kind of program that we're talking about. So in summary, very short summary, because I'm down to like two minutes. What this means for us as, as HR, this is what it means, is we need to step away from where we're at. The last while we've talked about being HR business partners, understand that when we made that transition from personnel to HR business partners, as there when Dave Ulrich was out on the road doing that, that was 25 years ago. 25 years ago that we've been talking about being an HR business partner. I don't care what model you're doing, 25 years is old. That's an old model. It's time, things have changed, it's time for a new model. This whole HR 3.0 is about coming to terms with where we're at today. As HR, we need to be a solution provider. This is not an HR problem, this is an everyone problem. And you need to take a leadership role because nobody else is going to do it inside your organization. You need to take charge, you need to be that leader. It takes new mindset. So you need to be a business consultant. You're not an HR consultant, you are a business consultant. You need to take that business acumen <coughs> and recognize and talk to them like a business. You're, you're solving a business problem, not an HR problem. This is not a personal problem, this is a business problem. And you need to take that mindset and step in that way. You need to MSU to GSD. Sometimes you gotta make stuff up to get stuff done. <laughs> you won't have the answers to most of this. You won't. So you're gonna to have to be creative and work with others to solve the problems. And then finally, there is not gonna be a quick fix. And you've gotta get that through their minds. There is no quick fix, but the sooner you start, the sooner you're gonna get there, and the better it's gonna be. And that's gotta to happen today. So anyway, a um, lot to take in. I do not apologize. But I'll uh, get the slides out. If you want more, reach out to me. Feel free to reach out. But uh, anyway, I appreciate your time. And uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Amy.